I'm Daniel. Um, I did a lot of uh, stuff on OpenWT in the past few years, not necessarily related to routing, but more generally to um, embedded developments. But I'm pretty familiar with lots of uh, wireless ad hoc routed uh, environments because I'm living in such an environment myself. And beyond routing, we, we face a variety of problems. And this is where GNUnet might become handy. So what is GNUnet? Um, GNUnit was originally meant to be a tool for anonymous peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Um, it, it was started at the time when the first wave of uh, copyright-based repression hit the generation two file sharing networks. So this was the time when Audio Galaxy and uh, eDonkey and all those second generation peer-to-peer -peer protocols were facing more and more, or their users were facing more and more legal problems. So um, very wisely, the community developers at that time found each other in a situation uh, where they wanted to create something which is much harder to uh, survey and which would allow users to anonymously publish, search, and retrieve arbitrary uh, files. Um, in principle, this is very similar um, to what the Freenet project, um, for example, also does. And there are a bunch of uh, um, similar approaches to distributed anonymous storage. Um, however, GNUnet can also be used for file sharing in closed user groups. You can add Imagine it as something like a drop-in replacement for Dropbox, which just doesn't require any servers, which is very nice. And still, you could choose who to give read-only access or read-write access to a virtual directory, which um, is living inside the distributed storage system. So um, GNUnit has a few um, key concepts, which is basically every uh, participating uh, pair is authenticated and identified uh, by an elliptic curve uh, key pair. And um, it does do some uh, resource accounting in order to encourage people to uh, participate and contribute, uh, contribute resources such as uh, storage or bandwidth or uh, connectivity inside a certain address family. Um, and regarding the original use case, which, as I said, is uh, anonymous file sharing, it offers some confidentiality, um, some degree of configurable anonymity. So you have this magic slider where you can basically say, I want this to be as fast as possible, or I want to be as anonymous as possible, which would obviously make the operation much slower. So if you use GNUnet, which is an ongoing uh, discussion, for example, for uh, downloading your Linux distribution, ISO images, that does not usually require a high degree of anonymity, but you would just want to get the thing as fast as you can, even more so for publishing such a uh, Linux distribution, ISO image. Um, you can do that completely legally in most parts of the world, so there is no uh, specific need to do that anonymously, so you can do it with a performance, uh, with a slider on the performance edge of the scale. Um, GNUnet basically um, started off a long ago, which I, I'm going to tell a bit of the history of the project on the next slide, or <laughs> when I scroll down a bit more. But in order to implement that initial use case, um, they came up with, as a bycatch kind of, they came up with solutions um, with problems hidden underneath that original use case. And the solutions to these problems um, are useful for other purposes um, than the original use case. So what, what came out of there is basically we, we got a completely usable um, distributed public key infrastructure um, in which you can uh, delegate um, identities. It's, it's similar to uh, uh, your Java roster or to your Facebook friends. And then you could like add friends of friends easily and um, define who to give access to resources or also identify communication partner. Besides the original use case, GNUnit also added um, a uh, chat and uh, voice over IP utility. So you can actually use it to make uh, phone calls. And because that's the other thing, it has a variety of uh, transports. 
So um, it can work over TCP, UDP, and it implements HTTP and HTTPS as both the client and the server side of the story. It has a native Bluetooth transport, which is pretty obscure, and it has a very slow, not very well working Wi-Fi transport, which is kind of a bit outdated. Um, it does a peer discovery using multicast, and peers um, do exchange contacts to other peers they know and have in their note cache. And um, in order to um, have routing, because that's kind of needed, because peers don't necessarily have direct uh, communication capabilities, they might both be behind uh, evil network address translation um, scenarios or corporate firewalls, which will not allow them to communicate directly. But so at least the uh, um, one, one or two hop uh, scenarios are very, very common in peer-to-peer -peer protocols in, in general. So for that reason, they introduced a DHT-based routing scheme and came up with a special variant of a DHT called R5N. And there's a lot of white paper about it. I haven't read any of it, I must admit. So the project history, it's, it's, it's basically it's a GNU project, as the name suggests. Um, it's developed mainly at the Technical University of Munich and in the French uh, INRIA. Um, it's written in C and it's, it originally came with this nice GTK plus graphical user interface which kind of takes you back to the end of the 90s looking at the eDonkey interface and you may search and download files. Um, as there's really a lot, a lot, a lot of white paper and research uh, done around it which is also due to some universities they realize like if people go to the distributed computing lectures and then they have to do their seminar works um, usually they end up re-implementing very, very trivial um, issues because that's the first thing they, they have to get used to. They have to do some kind of uh, peers has to do, have to discover each other, they have to be able to communicate across network address translation, they probably have to punch some holes into some firewalls, which is basically what every peer-to-peer -peer protocol has to do. So. Uh, they had this problem that supposedly students were all solving these problems ever and ever again. So at some point the projects were more and more uh, put, in, put into the frame of let's solve that as a model for GNU-NET. Um, GNU aims to be uh, portable, both portable and modular. Modular to the degree that it really follows this original Unix paradigm of having uh, a lot of small services and a lot of small single purpose executables which all together um, can be used to uh, follow the original path of the file sharing use case or you may also strip away certain things and um, this is what I'm going to get to why it's specifically interesting in community mesh networks because I can see all this uh, you know, question marks in your faces. Why am I doing a talk about file sharing? We all hate file sharing and it's our bandwidth, isn't it? So, um, so GNUnet was started in 2001, which is 13 years ago. And, you know, I had a look at it, I think something like 10 years ago, and I saw a, a not very well working file sharing tool. And then a few years later, I heard that they're going to rewrite it from scratch. And I said, okay, good guys, so see you in a couple of years. And um, now, a few months ago, um, um, there was an indication that we should, you know, give it a shot and see what we can actually do with it. Because also in the Technical University of Munich, they're apparently um, using their local supercomputer to drive a virtual testbed with up to a few thousand nodes, which um, is a lot, but it's still um, virtual. And as we all know, routing protocols might behave very different in the real world. Another interesting thing is that um, GNUnet implements and adds to their uh, Git repository, or uh, subversion repository in that case, I'm sorry, um, a lot of uh, code which could be used for um, exploiting possible vulnerabilities or uh, doing malicious behavior. So you could also evaluate the behavior of the algorithms in an unfriendly environment and also you, you start to document the possible attack um, cases. So there's still some components which are under um, development which are not uh, enabled by default right now. One of them is they want to have some kind of onion routing which uh, apparently is called BRAMS or RPS. 
Then there is a multicast routing engine on the way, um, which is then being harvested to be used for uh, some social media multi-user um, chat tool, which you can imagine as something similar to uh, sending WhatsApp messages to uh, a user group or um, following people on Twitter. So stuff like that could be implemented using these paradigms. They also recently started adding uh, distance vector based routing for the most local environment because the um, DHT based routing doesn't converge very well in local mobile environments. So it starts to be more of a hybrid routing engine rather than uh, just a proactive routing engine based on the DHT as it was before. And they're adding some uh, RESTful interfaces for other services to access. So um, yeah, what I just said, it's basically uh, just a bunch of services communicating with each other using well-defined protocols on Unix domain sockets or using TCP um, in case Unix domain sockets are unavailable, which is the case, for example, on certain operating systems or when interoperating with uh, high-level languages which might not support um, Unix domain sockets. Um, all services and uh, tools share a common configuration backend. So yeah, you, you basically have a single configuration uh, for all the GNU stuff you're doing on one system. And it has a graphical user interface as well as a bunch of command line tools. So to get back to community wireless networks and why would we want something like GNUnet in there is basically because it can solve problems which uh, are relevant in community wireless networks and do not directly um, have to do anything with routing algorithms, though DNS, for example, could be solved by any cast. For example, you could just any cast a DNS server. That's what I saw many people doing. But having a truly decentralized naming system um, with the possibility to um, delegate uh, subzones of your private zone basically to other people is a very nice option. You can imagine to have a uh, zone for each, uh, maintained by each wireless um, operator, basically, which may each have several routers and would just enumerate the uh, public keys of the router into a readable, human understandable, memorizable form, just like what DNS is for IP addresses. Um, it can also store um, classic DNS records, so you can have A and uh, quad A IP version 6 records in there. And um, it can be used beyond the scope of GNUnet, so beyond what I just said before, this Unix domain socket service interfaces. You can also just use the name service switch, which is unfortunately available only on uh, glibc Linux systems traditionally, to have a name resolution performed uh, using the GNUnet name system. Um, rather than uh, using DNS or MDNS or ETC hosts or what you would usually um, have in that place. And for systems which do not have a name service switch, you could, for example, use a DNS to a GNS gateway. There's also the option of using a SOX proxy to directly access services using their name, like SOX5, where you actually connect to a host name, and um, that would be automatically resolved to GNUnet. Um, Another thing you can do using GNUnet is you can tunnel existing other services through it. So that kind of puts it into the same category as um, other overlay networks. Um, you can do similar things. You could also do um, uh, with, like with all distributed uh, VPN services with, of course, the performance impact um, of having a encapsulation and routing done in user space, which basically means a lot of mem copy. So this is never going to have extremely great performance unless somebody wants to rewrite it in kernel space. Um, but it's still very, very useful due to the vast amount of transport plugins because it can really get around every firewall. And um, what was only possible for people for now by renting a server in a data center or having at least one system which is available for incoming port 80 or port 443 connections 
on a public IP version 4 address, which is something you need to pay for. Um, using GNUnit, you can basically have that for free because some people um, who use GNUnit will have good connectivity and the routing algorithm will make sure that you can like indirectly um, reach the services or endpoints you want to reach. Um, you could use that for offering, first of all, access to the ARPA internet, um, just like an exit node, if you would call it in the Tor terms, basically, um, version 4 and version 6. Or you could also offer just uh, internic uh, name resolution, like the traditional top-level domains we all know. Um, it also offers some kind of automatic protocol translation, so if you want to connect to a service which is usually exposed on IP version 6 but you are on a system which is uh, not capable of IP version 6, GNUnit will automatically carry out the translation of TCP to TCP version 6 and vice versa. Um, which is nice if, uh, for example, you have IP version 6 internet connectivity on the exit side but you want to use IP version 4 applications to access services. Um, so that's all very transparent and probably you need to play with it to see the actual advantage of that. Um, so tunneling stuff through GNUnet can um, help a lot connecting uh, wireless network segments which are usually um, connected through a central VPN server because the advantage compared to using FASTD or OpenVPN, which we, what we usually do in these places, is that once um, both communication partners, which basically both sit behind um, DSL routers, both don't expose any incoming ports to the public internet, um, will still be able to communicate directly once they, uh, they had a directed handshake using the central server. That means that all the traffic can be directly between these two peers um, and doesn't have to travel all the way through the server, which just saves us a lot of bandwidth, obviously, and we will need less um, resources for VPN servers, which becomes a, increasingly becomes a problem in many environments with a lot of VPN tunnels. Um, yeah. That's it, basically. Um, this is what we can use GNUnit for. GNUnit has a routing algorithm built in, and the idea um, is also to make some performance measurements now during Battle Mesh. The performance will um, be very, very bad, obviously, because it's not focused on performance at all, but rather on security and anonymity, which is something which are like, these are values which are pretty hard to, to measure. Um, but I tried to do some iPerf measurements um, and see how this routing algorithm actually performs. So um, we will have some numbers to compare. Yeah, questions? Do you have some numbers? How much resources are needed to uh, let it run on an OpenWRT router? Yes, um, I basically ported GNUnit to OpenWRT uh, in the past few months. And um, if you want to use only the um, VPN and uh, name system capabilities and you don't want to use any file sharing and at least not any publishing file sharing capabilities for because for that you need like metadata extraction and you know stuff like libgstreamer which you certainly don't want to have on a router. Um, um, given all that it can be something like uh, 600 kilobytes of uh, flash which is still quite a lot and I hope to further reduce it by um, having, because GNUnit is using different backends for storage, for persistency, and even for the smallest possible things, they're already using uh, libsqlite. So sqlite, um, as we all know, is not, not the smallest thing on earth, and you know, a bunch of text files would probably do in that place, so, or just have memory, have structures which do it all in RAM, like just a heap, which, uh, because you don't want to have SQLite writing things to your flash because then your flash memory is going to die very, very soon. So the whole idea of persistency needs to be solved differently on small embedded systems than on desktop systems because you want to be very, very stingy on your write cycles, obviously. Um, but it's doable. RAM usage is pretty moderate. Like You don't need all the services running and because um, like from what I could see on a system with 32 megs of RAM, 
it can work. It probably you will shit will hit the fan once you use more stuff simultaneously because after all, just having the basic unit services running, you can expect something like in production use, like when you actually make connections to other nodes and you know the peer cache is filling up, then you can expect it to consume about 8 to 12 megs of RAM, which you know will blow up your 32 megs RAM router once you start an HTTP server simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, but every time I look at it, I play with it, and I spend an afternoon playing, I get the impression that it lacks focus, that it is doing a lot of things. Uh, could you tell us whether there is a killer feature of Lunas, whether there is the feature that nobody else has, or are you just trying to do a lot of things correctly that other people are already doing in dedicated projects? It's, um I have to say, it's, it's, I'm not a GNUnit developer, so I can't answer this question on behalf of GNUnit, first of all. Like, under my impression, um, you could have all these things, like uh, NAT traversal, peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer routing, um, which would then make an overlay net, and then you could have some distributed storage on top of an overlay network, and then you could you know, make sure to bring some anonymity and security back in there. The problem uh, which comes up is that if you do it that way around, then um, anonymity will be something very hard to achieve, because if you try to add this only using, for example, onion routing, then someone who observes all the timing will have an easy way to de-anonymize everyone. So you will have to think about where will you introduce random traffic, random delays, random padding, so that uh, package size and package timing can no longer be um, matched against each other on both ends. So, to de so in order to de-anonymize users, which is the main argument of community developers, why not to um, have several uh, layers inside the TCP IP model basically to stack on top of each other to achieve the same on an application level. But they rather say no, the TCP IP level has, a uh, TCP IP model has some inherent problems because it never had a focus on anonymity and even security is hard to add and almost impossible to, to configure. Um, I'll perhaps put my question a little bit differently. Okay. Suppose I want to show Luna Yeah, you would you would start the GTK so user. Cool. Yeah, you would start the GTK user interface and you know tell her to put something in the search field, and she would actually start finding actual content. And you would tell her you can download what you want. No lawyer will ever send you a letter. Okay, so the, uh, the, 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 the you consider the file sharing as a killer feature. That's what the GNUnit developers claim. Yes, and this is this is the use case which. Uh, What's the motivation to implement other things as well? Um, okay. Yeah. So how many people are actually running at the moment? So I think about seven, which like puts obviously puts the anonymity in a very theoretical scale, <laughs> because if you're hiding among a crowd of seven, then probably you're not very anonymous. Arrest them all. Uh, fortunately, most of them are in inside academic institutions, which makes it a bit harder <laughs> to arrest them all. <laughs> okay. No, but it's really just a few dozens of people. Like, I, is the note cache hardly grows. All the um, simulations and experiments uh, carried out by both the French INRIA and the Technical University of Munich are inside separate test beds, not connected to the real world internet. So you don't actually see that the network suddenly has like 15,000 nodes and then they suddenly disappear once they finish their simulation. Which is also due to um, GNUnit doing some kind of uh, calculation of a proof of work, um, which makes it harder to spoof uh, new nodes uh, because they first need to get a reputation by solving that riddle. Um, similar to what Bitcoin does basically. So if you simulate a large amount of nodes, what you usually do is 
you, you disable this checking of the proof of work because it will just waste a lot, a lot, a lot of CPU cycles and you actually want to you know, uh, benchmark the routing algorithm or um, stuff like that and then this will not be there. Yes. Initially, just once. Like, it doesn't do that all the time. It's not blockchain based. And so, unless Namecoin, that's also why I think it's more suitable to solve name resolution in an embedded environment compared to Namecoin. Because for Namecoin, you need to participate in a blockchain all the time. So, GNUnit, what they do is basically they just have you solve uh, one riddle for each new identity, for each new key pair you create, which is a cons which is a rather constant cost. You can also have that pre-calculated on a more powerful system and then copy it to your embedded router so it will not you know, be busy calculating this proof of work for like four days or something. Like on a common x86 machine it usually takes from a few hours to one day and then you have a usable identity. Yes, for one public key identity to be with good reputation, which doesn't mean that you can't use it without that. Even if you don't, haven't finished calculating this proof of work, this just means that other nodes will probably give you lower priority um, uh, w when it comes to answering your requests. As long as there's not a lot of traffic generated by people who already did calculate the proof of work, that's not really a problem. So you can use it like from the first minute on. Ah, okay. Uh, basically, it's, um, there is no such a thing as a global namespace, which is maybe there is a, a shared namespace, which is also searchable for file sharing. But what you do for uh, um, it's it's rather delegative. So what you do, you have your private zone, which is something you can imagine like a dot me, and then you add your friends. So um, let's say I, I add Elektra and Axel. So I would have Elektra dot me and Axel dot me. And then um, Axel probably has a friend uh, called Thomas. So I don't know Thomas, but I could still reference Thomas by thomas.axel.me. Did that answer the question more or less? Yeah. Cool. Yes, I, about this local namespace, it's not like reinventing the web of trust of PGP. Because in PGP, names. A, uh, a real meaning only if you trust the key of there is a uh, trust path between you and the name. You know? mm -hmm. And it's, it's something it's already exists, not exit this. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very it's very similar. Just that PGP doesn't you know listen on port 53 UDP. Yeah. Yeah. You could you could implement that using the PGP Web of Trust. Very true. Because I am my. My my biggest concern was about why do uh, why don't you use the PGP identity and use RSA for public key and pub and private key? Why invent another ID format? I ID format is that what you said? Not IP, ID. but identity. Like why why do, why why is, why not reuse the um, PGP key? storage format. I don't know, it would definitely be, be a, an option if you would use only um, RSA. Um, today uh, GNUnit uses elliptic curve uh, key pairs for identities. I don't think that's uh, implemented in PGP as far as I know. It does RSA and, uh, and DSA. So um, also for keys to be uh, more handy and shorter, especially if you have a lot of them in like DNS-like zones. Uh, it's more handy to have elliptic curve keys. So that's, uh, I guess that's the main reason, but it's, it's just a guess. I think it's uh, related, I think, to your question. Uh, you might be wondering about the, the actual resolution, right? You might care about the resolution to the path. Uh, wanting to avoid I can that. hardly hear you. Like you might want the resolution. Your question about PGP is not just about the key format, but also about the resolution. Trust. Yeah, it's, uh, it's about why not we yeah, so I'll give you a similar answer for uh, because we uh, 
uh, and my team has had the same question. Uh, the reason is that uh, that carries a lot of baggage and tries you into work only one trust, uh, web trust. So you should implement it as one of them, but not necessarily the only one, because there are cases where you can't uh, you, you can't use uh, that model. Um, so that, mm -hmm. that might be the same reason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Also, the 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 the, the PGP um, Web of Trust model has some has some inherent flaws, basically mostly in the lingo, because it's um, I don't know anybody who actually publicly signs somebody else's key, because that also always means that you publicly claim to trust someone else, and you don't even explicitly say what you trust him. Or her. So basically, um, this is something which is already solved in uh, uh, more recent versions of uh, SSL slash TLS, where certificates have a certification purpose, which is just a, a field where Netscape at some point started to enumerate, yeah, you're a certification authority, and uh, you're an email user, and you're a web server. And they realized that these are different certification purposes, which is something the uh, GNU PG PGP model uh, cannot express, which is a problem and probably the reason why people don't um, sign other people's keys because it's like, what, what does it actually mean? Like, there's no defined meaning. Do I know you? Did I check your ID card? Do I trust you in my life? Like, you know, what does it mean? Um, which is another uh, reason. While on GNUnet, basically, these um, uh, delegations, like if you add somebody into your name zone, this can either be public, so people could also use that indirectly, like in the example I made before. Um, or you could also have it just private, um, which means that the, the bond between you and another community participant uh, does not need to be public. Like, you locally sign PGP keys, that's also possible with PGP, true. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes? Sorry? Does this go beyond? The link does exist and does not exist? Is it binary or is there something like something Yes, there, 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 um, yes, uh, there are, um, it, there's a bandwidth and a, a delay based metric. Also, to evaluate the multiple transport paths you might have between the same two nodes. Like the same two nodes can possibly communicate using TCP, using UDP or using HTTP, and in some cases it, it seems like, even though technically you might assume that, yeah, UDP will definitely have the best performance and then probably followed by TCP and, you know, implementing an HTTPS client and server transport will probably be much slower, but in practice that's often not true because internet service providers prioritize um, HTTPS traffic because that's the e-commerce world, so you can just make all your distributed VPN look like really crucial e-commerce traffic, which might be a non-technical but rather, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, advantage uh, to get hold of more bandwidth. And there's an, a service which is called the automatic transport selection, which then tries to find the best way between two neighbors to communicate, basically. And uh, beyond the scale of uh, neighbors, um, like in the routing algorithm, it, you, you do have some, some metric to decide uh, which path to take, but I think the more, how to say, the more polished edge is definitely between two direct neighbors or communication partners where you do have all this transport selection going on. While the routing, uh, in the routing you still have a lot of metrics which are based on uh, uh, round trip times and we all know that that won't work well. Um, in the, like, what I'm going to do here is basically um, limit, uh, limit the whole thing to use only the, the UDP transport, also for space reasons, because I don't want to carry around the libraries to implement HTTP server and client um, for space, flash space reasons. And um, so all what is left then is the round trip time based metric, which is subject to be replaced at some point. And but it's not being replaced yet. But how do you map packet loss to delay? Okay. Sorry? How do you map packet loss to delay? You don't, or not, not, not as I'm aware. If your metric is based on delay or a long trip time, 
Mm -hmm. How do you deal with the lost packet? Probably um, you have two cases, either to pack uh, the hello and the guys and seeds, mm -hmm. and then you have mostly the same one per time. Yes. Because you use UDP, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or it does not succeed, which is uh, like infinitive one per time. Yes. And then you build an average between a fixed number and infinitive. So, how do you map lost? You know, understand my question? Yes, yes, I, I, get, I get your question. I don't know how it is actually implemented. Um, we can have a look later, maybe. It's an interesting question. Basically, when you start doing that on the LAN, for example, and you start it on another one, will they find each other? And start yeah, yeah, there's some local peer discovery using UDP multicast on IPv6 and broadcast on And if I want to use it uh, in the World Wide Web online, then I need to connect to a known trusted new net node in order to become part of the network, right? Um, basically, the, 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 the architecture allows you to use it as a friend-to-friend -friend only network. However, in the uh, current uh, distribution, um, you, you have some predefined um, seed nodes and trust their public keys in order to be part of the global public cloud, which then makes it work like any peer-to-peer -peer network. You could just join anonymously. So it's, it's kind of both. You can choose. There is a local discovery and there is yeah, you can. The local discovery um, on a transport level just makes sure that um, two peers inside the same broadcast domain will, will find each other. If you have that switched on, then um, they also communicate with each other, learn about other peers, and uh, start the whole show, basically. Um, if you wanted to prevent that for security reasons, then... Yeah, but there is no, no trust whatsoever in such a case. Yeah. Right. But that's only for routing uh, and for looking at content. Right. Uh, the content should still be secured, right, by actual content hashes and signatures and so on. Exactly, yes, yes, yes. So that, that would just give you access to the transport level and would not necessarily um, uh, give you any uh, privilege uh, in, in, in terms of retrieving or publishing files or communicating with others. So your proposal for networks like Freifunk is, Freifunk, please, can you complete that sentence? Okay, um, uh, yes. Uh, uh, GNU, like um, community wireless networks could test deploy or learn um, how to um, solve uh, name resolution in a delegated distributed way from GNUnit, either by using the GNUnit implementation or by having a look at it and you know making a more slim more target focused implementation of that so it's that's that's one of the things and it could also be used to replace the currently very centrally managed uh, VPNs to connect different uh, Freifunk networks with each other over commercial ISP links with all the problems of NAT traversal and firewall hole punching and stuff like that. No more questions? Cool. Um, so but Oh wow, oh wow. Can you show us how to download and <laughs> Maybe we can do that offline. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah offline also. <laughs> also true, also true. Yeah, thank you all for attending. Um, if anyone wants to uh, play with GNUnet on his desktop system, laptop system, router, um, basically the minimum requirements to run it on, on routers on an 8 megabyte flash and 64 megabyte RAM device, I could even download stuff like f files with gigabytes of size with more or less reasonable performance of a few megabits. Um, so it's definitely worth uh, getting the hands on it and giving it a try. OpenWT packages are available in uh, the usual OpenWT slash packages repository on GitHub. So anyone who has a more or less recent OpenWT build should be able to install them. All right. Cool.